All right, well, I guess uh, we're going to get going. I'm texting one of my colleagues here. Hope you appreciate my lecture. She's not here at the beginning, um, but that's all right. All right, so we are, just to review a little bit, we're on the sociology of religion now. And this is part of our larger discussion of uh, functionalism. So with functionalism, we've been focusing on two topics that are dear, near and dear to functionalism's heart. We said that functionalism is trying to understand how to get people to work together in a smooth way, harmonious way, and to create social stability and social solidarity. And so religion, uh, well, the first thing we studied was rules. Rules are one of the ways Shared common rules are one of the things that make a group feel like a group, according to functionalism. And so we learned all about rules and crime and deviance. And now we're on religion because religion is another source of solidarity, of people having shared values, shared norms. And so for functionalism, religion is a really key idea. But we started with Marx, and we said that Marx saw religion as a, a tool of domination. Remember we said Marx called religion the opiate of the masses. So he saw it as kind of a drug that people take to feel better about their miserable existence. But in his view, they're doing the wrong thing if they want to really make their existence better than taking a drug called religion um, won't do it. Uh, and so in his view, they need to be in, engaged in the real world, not in the uh, supernatural afterlife world, but in the, in the real world of union meetings, uh, political rallies, political parties, those are the groups and organizations, uh, in Marx's view, one should join if you want to uh, make your life better. So Marx saw that uh, religion is not science, it's kind of the opposite of science. In his view, Marx, his, Marxism itself, his, an, his analysis of capitalism uh, that we've already learned about was science. That is looking at the real world, we talked about him being a materialist, looking at objective reality, the actual stuff you could measure and touch and taste and feel. And so Marx really believed people who are living in the religious world are not living in reality, they're living in a, in a false reality. In fact, he called it false consciousness. In his view, real consciousness would be consciousness of your class. If you were really awake and woke in Marx's terms, you would be thinking of your class as your main team. And if you're a working person, that means, you know, all working people are your team, uh, whether they're a different race or a different gender, different nationality. And so Marx thought religion is a false consciousness. It's making people think they're something that they're not. And by, for example, if you think of yourself as Christian, then you think of all Christians as your brothers and sisters, rather than thinking of your class group as your brothers and sisters. And so Marx thought people are just being led astray. And he thought of it as a tool of domination, so that the upper class is using this tool to separate people from their true brotherhood and sisterhood. So instead of joining together with working class people, we go to church and listen to rich people tell us why we're sinners and why we need to feel guilty um, when we should be out there with our brothers and sisters fighting for better treatment by those rich people. And so Marx sees religion as a kind of the opposite of science, and if you really have a hard-nosed scientific understanding of your life, you wouldn't have any need for religion. You would be you know, involved in other things. And Marx seems to but he does call it the sigh of the oppressed, as we talked about. So he does understand that people at an individual level uh, gain something from religion. I mean, it makes you feel better in a lot of cases. And if you can think about things that aren't here and that are in a better place, you know, maybe that does make you feel better. Um, and so Durkheim, though, says Marx is looking at things all wrong here. The term we're going to use is collective effervescence.
but I don't want to get ahead of myself. That's a weird term that I'm going to have to explain, but comparing to Marx. So what is, what is Durkheim trying to get at here? Um, Durkheim uh, is trying to understand that uh, maybe if you were really looking at religion in a scientific way, you wouldn't think of religion and science as opposite things. In other words, uh, people need to have a solidarity. They need to have a sense of a group that they're part of. And in his view, religion is, is that. Um, and so how do we explain that? Um, he's trying to get, uh, let me put it this way. Marx seems to think that, uh, or he's focused on the individual needs So, for example, as an individual, you need to feel good. I mean, you want happiness, and you want to have meaning in your life. A lot of us turn to religion because we ask, for example, you know, why am I here on planet Earth? What's the purpose of my life? Why do I exist? Those are basic existential questions, we call them, like, what is existence all about? And all of us have them. My children ask me these kinds of questions. I'm sure you thought of these things when you were little. And religion is an answer to those questions. If you have these individual needs to figure out what am I doing here and why, how am I supposed to feel about it, then a story about, you know, one day there was, you know, God created heaven and the earth and, you know, there was Adam and Eve and all this stuff. It helps you figure out all of that stuff. It, it, in other words, we have these existential questions and religion answers them for us. But Durkheim asks, what about the group needs? Groups are entities that are separate from individuals. They're made up of individuals, but they're not in themselves an individual. They are a group. And groups have needs, too. In order for a group to continue existing, it has to fulfill certain needs. And Durkheim says, if we want to understand religion sociologically, we need to look at it from that angle. Why would groups create religions? We can understand, you know, from a psychological standpoint, why an individual might want to be religious. But if we're trying to be sociologists, not psychologists, we need to ask, why did groups create these belief systems called religions? Uh, so I won't write all that down, but you can say that. That's the question he started asking. Why would groups create belief systems? That's what religions are. And he says, to really answer that group need question, we should go back to earlier times, because our world today is so complicated and groups are complicated. Like, what is an American? I mean, we're asking that every day, because really Americans are made up of multiple groups. I mean, we're different ethnic groups and class groups and gender groups and all that stuff. So if we go back to a very simple kind of group, a primitive group, uh, maybe if we can understand their need for religion, we would be gaining some insight into why complicated societies like ours still might need religion. And uh, he looks at what he calls these uh, totemic religions. Totemic. So we're talking about religions before there was Christianity, before there was Islam, before there was Judaism. Uh, before all those major religions that we're aware of today, people have religious beliefs. We know from archaeological evidence that primitive, quote unquote, primitive groups had these uh, religious beliefs. They believed in supernatural things. And so Durkheim's asking, well, why did they? What, what were they gaining as a group? Um, and we know about these, uh, uh, the term that's used for these groups is totemic. What's a totem? You know what a totem pole is? What's a totem pole? They're famous uh, among Indian, uh, Native Americans of the Northwest. It's a tall pole like that made up of heads, heads of animals usually, carved wooden heads. And each head represents a different clan or group in the overall tribe. And so when Western anthropologists, scientists from Europe, we're studying these groups and going, you know, why do they have animal heads as the thing that they're putting on their poles in the middle of their campsites? Are they animal worshipers? That's what uh, a lot of Western scientists assumed by 
looking at these when they were looking at these totemic religions. And if you're an animal worshiper, that would suggest very backward, you know, to these Western Christian eyes, a very backward, weird thing. And we need to save these people from their weird animal worship. Well, Durkheim looks at this same data, the same evidence on uh, totemic religions and says, I don't think animal worship is the correct analysis of what's going on here. What we need to understand is what do these things symbolize? What are these uh, collective symbols? Um, uh, and so I'm not explaining it well, but it goes back to this idea of collective effervescence. And I'm trying to, I don't want to spend too much time on Durkheim, sometimes I do, but what is collective effervescence? Um, well, let's break that word down. It means group, collective in this case, a group of people. Effervescence, you may know that term from, anybody know that term from chemistry? When something's effervescent, what is it? It's uh, bubbly or fizzy. I would call this group fizziness. Group fizziness. Can you imagine a group being fizzy, a group being bubbly? Are you guys a group right now? Are you being, are we having collective effervescence in here right now, would you think? Are we fizzing and bubbling right now? Maybe not. Uh, where might we go, though, to see a group of people that are kind of bubbling together, that are fizzing? I mean, that's Turkheim's word for it, but do you, can you think of examples in your mind of a group of people that would match that? Description? Maybe like a sports game. Okay, or a sporting event. What do people do? Like, like the beam, I'm a Kings fan. What kind of things do people do at sporting events, the group of people, the audience, that look like they're fizzing together? Cheering. Cheering, or like, have you ever seen the wave? The wave, a whole group of people create this whole dance by like all standing up at the right time and then sitting back down. Or everybody going, light the beam, light the beam. I don't know if you're a Kings fan, but uh, let, or, you know we had the uh, you were called 49ers the other night. I didn't get to go to that, but uh, how did you know when people cheer together as a group, they are beginning to do things together that you could never do as an individual. It's a kind of group magic, is another way I would put it. Group magic. If you've never experienced group magic, I feel bad for you, but uh, it's one of the wonderful human experiences when human people get together and they achieve this electrical charge between each other in a group that uh, you can't get by yourself. Um, when I was, uh, well, can you think of things that you like to do, but when you do them by yourself, you are not that proficient at it or not that great, but when it's with a group of people, you really it really comes together. Um, my example is I like to play conga drums. I have some percussion instruments at home. I like to play my conga drums. But if I'm just playing by myself, bah, bah, you know, I'll get bored after a while because there's only so many little tricks I can do to keep myself interested. But if you get in a drum circle, and I'm playing congas, but other people are playing bongos, other people are wood blocks and rattlers, and now you get a thing going that's a repetitive thing, blah, 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 and everyone's doing their part, and it all comes together in a way that suddenly you feel a power inside yourself that you didn't have before. Like my left hand, by when I'm by myself, is not very proficient. I'm so right-handed. But when you're in the group of people, and the drum circle is really going, and the beat's really happening, and I'm like, wow, my left hand, look at that thing. It's going, like I didn't know I could do that. Or if you're in theater, anybody who's been in theater, when you have an audience, and the audience's energy and electricity connects with the audience and uh, the electricity of the performers, and you get this like synergy, and everyone's connected in a weird way. It's a, it's a magical feeling. And Durkheim imagines, what would the first groups, if you were a quote-unquote primitive tribe of people living in a jungle or a forest or a, a prairie somewhere, and you don't know much about life. All you know is, you know, the sun comes up and we got to get food and stuff like that. I mean, um, what we would now call ignorant and just not conscious of it as many things as we are today. And so you are uh, a very early group. Uh, but he imagines that what if that group experienced a collective effervescent event? What would that be like? And I always try to imagine, uh, well, I'll just do this. So let's say we... Uh, 
We're sitting around the campsite one day. We're the tribe. We're the tribe of the 1019s, Maidu tribe. And we are uh, hanging around our camp, kind of bored. We got plenty of food. We're hanging around, and uh, somebody just kind of starts doing this with a stick. A lot. Could have brought some percussion instruments. And somebody else is like, wait, I'm hearing something else there. I'm hearing like. And then you hear like, and then somebody else is like, you're kind of making me want to do a little dance around the circle. And we start like dancing around the fire, and you're chanting, and I'm drumming, and they're singing, and we're getting into it. And it's like a whole rave going on around our campfire. And we're doing it all night long, and we're just having the best time we've ever had. And we flop down, and and we wake up the next morning, and I see you lying there, and I'm like, hey, wake up. Last night, were we just like dancing around the fire? Yes. And singing, we would be, yes. What was that? I don't know. Go to sleep. Go back to sleep. No, what was that? What was that thing that came over us? That, that group magic, that thing that happened. I don't know, but I want it to happen again. Do you? Like, how do we get this to happen again? And so the group is like trying to figure out what happened to us last night. This magic came over us. And how do we explain it? What, what was it? And Durkheim thinks people, the only way they could explain it was with the natural environment. Something must have come into our camp or done something to our camp to make us feel that way. Like, maybe it was the eagle. Didn't you see an eagle flying around our camp yesterday? Yeah, we all saw it. It dropped a feather. Get the feather. I'm going to get the feather. It's the feather. Stop looking at it, all right? Don't look at it. Unclean things get away from the, I'm talking about women, sorry. Mm -hmm. Women stay away from the feather. This is an altar. Men, come guard the feather with me. Men, females, just kind of back away from the feather. Stay over there. This is the side of the camp now that's not where the feather is. Over here. This is the sacred camp. Over here, you can talk and you can go poop and you can cook and we can do all the stuff we normally do over here, but over here, it's not. Sacred. Profane, sacred, not sacred. That's the essence of religious thinking. You begin to think that it's a realm of life that's not normal, that's not the everyday. That's uh, something sacred, something important, something magical. But what is that sacred and magical thing? It's us. It's our group. When we get together and we achieve that magic that I can't get by myself, that I can't dance around a fire and whoop and holler and feel great, but when we do it together, when we have that thing, our rave thing, or whatever we want to call it, our powwow, our ritual, uh, that's when we feel like we have our magical group. And so Durkheim says the real beginning of religion is sacred profane. When groups suddenly divide the world, they never did before, there was just survival. But suddenly, the world is two things. There's this sacred, magical thing that's part of our life, and then there's the everyday thing. Profane, we now use profane to mean like profanity, like bad word, but originally in Durkheim's terminology, it just means the not sacred, the not special, magical, mundane, everyday. And that basic distinction, it's what we now would call a binary opposition. Durkheim, by the way, is one of the founders of this idea that you can really understand culture by thinking of the binary oppositions, the things that are either or in that culture. But I don't want to get too ahead here. But the basic distinction of all cultures is us and them. And religion is the first awakening of this idea that there's an us, and this us is a magical thing that we need to protect and celebrate. And so once they start saying sacred profane, they start dividing the whole world into what is sacred, what we consider sacred, and what we consider profane. 
it starts to create what's called a collective consciousness. We're beginning to think alike as a group of people. We're not just living in the real world. We're living in an abstract world now in our heads of things that are magical and mystical and special and other things that are not. So things like the feather, that's magical and sacred. The eagle is magical and sacred. The sky where the eagle flies and its trees are magical and sacred. Over here, the ground where the feather fell, that's mundane, that's profane, that's normal. Don't let the feather touch the ground. Don't let the sacred touch the profane. And uh, what I'm trying to show you here is all groups have this sense that there are certain things that we consider sacred and important and magical and other things that we don't, and that we, as a group, we know we're a group because we're celebrating the sacred things. And Durkheim's trying to say, you know, you, it doesn't have to be Christianity or Judaism or Islam. Almost any group that's a real functioning group is going to have this sense of we as a group are a special thing and our symbols are special. So it can be a sports team. It could be a country. Like, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Whenever I see that flag, sacred. Don't let that flag touch the ground. Put that flag up there in a special place where we all can take a special time to put our hands over our heart and talk about it, pledge allegiance to it. That's religious behavior. It's not a religion, America, although for some people it is, but American patriotism is a similar thing, a collective effervescence that people got in these private, in these small tribes. But Durkheim's trying to say that basic function of feeling like your group, feeling special about your group, understanding that your group gives you a magic and power that you don't have as an individual. So you better come celebrate your group and be part of it and respect our rituals and respect our symbols. Uh, and these collective symbols, too, are the things that um, help people. These totems, by the way, he said, aren't really the animals. The eagle, when people are putting an eagle head on their totem pole, it isn't uh, literally the eagle that they're worshiping. It's the symbol of their group. We are the eagle people. The eagle chose us. The eagle dropped the feather. We love the eagle. He's sacred. But it's us that we're putting on that pole. And those other heads represent other groups in, the, in our larger group. So we have clans, and we have the overall tribe. So it's, no, they're not worshiping animals in a simple sense. They are worshiping human groups, which Durkheim tried to say, that's what all religions have done. Durkheim himself was born Jewish. His dad was Jewish, grandpa. And his dad was a rabbi, a religious leader. His grandpa was a rabbi. But Durkheim was growing up in the 19th century and was committed to science, as we're suggesting. He was trying to found the, soci the field of sociology and looking for a, a, a racer. Um, and so everybody expected him to go be a rabbi. Good little Emil Durkheim. But he decided, you know, that's not really for me. I'm a scientist. I do want to use science to understand the world uh, and not just go be a rabbi. I want to be a scientist. But he also, uh, you know, being in France, France is a predominantly, dominantly Catholic country. And uh, so he was always an outsider being a Jew. So it would be a choice to either give up your religion or join some other religion. What he really felt was that humanity itself needed a whole new religion. That humanity was really at this point one big tribe in, on planet Earth. And we had all these previous religions from previous tribes, Judaism being one of them, Islam being another, Sikhism being another. I mean, any religion is that group's Collective, it's that group celebration of its collective effervescence. And Durkheim said that's one of the problems with the modern world, is that we are one group as humanity, but we don't think of ourselves that way. We're still stuck in our old consciousness, collective consciousness as Jews or Muslims or Sikhs. And what we need to do is come together in one religion as humanity. Uh, but how would we do that? Um, basically science. 
Uh, and so he says, you know, sociology could be the modern religion, a modern kind of civic religion, in the sense that it would serve the same functions that religion serves for small primitive groups like a tribe of native people. What is that function? Well, make us understand that we're a group, give us common symbols, collective symbols to collectively, you know, give homage to, or I don't want to say worship, um, and to give us a sense of the us and the them, who are we, where do we fit, and what's around us. Um, that's what these groups, cultures did, is help orient them. Who are we, and who, what do we stand for, and how are we different from others? Well, in a, in a, and so, human, so sociology helps us see, according to Durkheim, as we've talked about in class, how we're all connected. It's a, the division of labor in our modern world is very complicated. So, for example, you have scientists, you have trash collectors, you have communications people, you have Air Force people, you have nurses. And on our day-to-day -day level, we don't feel connected at all. We feel like we're all so separate and have many different things we're supposed to be doing and different schedules and different languages. And, uh, but to make the whole system work, we all are part of it. But if you're not aware that you're part of a social system and how doctors help Air Force people, help nurses, help you know, trash collectors, if you're not thinking of those things, then you just don't feel connected to people and they're just obstacles to you or enemies of yours. But if you could come to think of it as all one group and you could understand as sociologists do how that system functions and how different parts all work together in one big machine, as we've talked about, then people would begin to be able to live together harmoniously in their times view in the same way that religion serves that function for a small group of people to make us feel connected, make us recognize the power we have that's separate from ourselves as an individual. And so that's what's lacking in the modern world. We are all connected, we are all working together, but we don't feel it or see it. And the average person doesn't see where they fit in. They just feel sometimes trapped in it or not sure what's expected of them. We used that term anno me before, which is not knowing what's expected of you. And if you're in a big, huge system and it's not clear where you fit, it's hard to know. Well, how should I act? What should be my daily morality that I should live by? And religion provides morality, but if people don't have one, or we haven't defined it yet, so he thought if we could teach us, develop this field called sociology and teach it to people so that people understood how the modern world works and where people fit in it, uh, we would begin to develop a common morality, a common set of norms and values that we all could live by. So that was Durkheim, and Durkheim, as I've said, sometimes can be seen as a little simplistic, a sort of kumbaya kind of idea, like let's all just come together and feel the same way, and then we'll all get along. It's not as simple as that, but, uh, but certainly conflict theorists like Marx would disagree with uh, what Durkheim's saying. Um, but what about Max Weber? So that's the third founder of sociology, as you know, and uh, we've also mentioned that Max Weber thought of himself as more historically sophisticated than Marx or Durkheim, in that he was aware of maybe more of human history than they were. Uh, but he has a point of departure with both Marx and Durkheim. So Marx and Durkheim seem to be saying that religion is a force for conservatism, in, in a way. It's a conservative force. I don't mean necessarily in a political sense, although it kind of is re related, but a conservative force in the sense of holding a group together, holding a society together, and keeping it from changing very much. In other words, Marx says that the, as we talked about, the ruling elite uses religion to keep the working people from challenging the system and just keeping this capitalist system going as it is. So it conserves, it helps conserve capitalism. And yeah, as you know, in our modern world, a lot of people that are the most religious are the most conservative. And Durkheim too seems to say that if you want a group to work together and be harmonious and smoothly functioning, they need to have this thing, this called religion, this collective sense of who they are and what they believe. But Weber says religion has been and can be 
of course, for radical social change. And so if you look back at human history and you understand what religion has been involved with, you can't just see it as something that's kept things the same and kept things from changing. It's been sometimes the source of major change going on in a society. And so Weber makes an argument here that's come down as even more famous in some ways than Marx's and Durkheim, which is that capitalism itself, the capitalism system that we live under, is in a way a product of a very particular set of religious ideas. And so one of the things Weber is trying to do here is show that ideas do matter, that it isn't just the economic system that leads to ideas, but sometimes people's ideas are the things that create changes in, our, in the structure of our society and new economic systems, for example. So Weber wrote a famous book called The, the Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. where he's trying to make the argument that our capitalist system is uh, at root based on a certain kind of ethical principle, certain religious belief. And he's tracing this to the Protestants. So um, we've talked a little bit about Protestantism before in this class. It was uh, a form of Christianity that broke away from Catholicism and uh, the control of the, the Catholic Church. And uh, it's associated with people like Martin Luther and um, another famous Protestant was a guy named Calvin. And uh, the Calvinists are the people who were, we now, we now call them the pilgrims. If I can write this clearly. And uh, So Calvinism is a religious sect started by John Calvin, I think that's his first name, right? And uh, they were the people that in England, they were a very kind of uh, conservative Christian sect. Sect is a smaller version of a larger religion. Uh, so they were a conservative Christian sect. And uh, the way Weber puts it is their beliefs were so kind of out there that they were a threat to various other power structures. So for example, in England, the King of England did not like Calvinists and said, you know, your form of Protestantism, I don't really want to see it here in England. And he kind of pushed them out. They ended up going, I think, to Holland, some of them, and other places at first. And eventually the King of England said, well, you know, we do have these places called America that we control, but there's a bunch of Native Americans there, and so we need some white people to go, you know, colonize and live on the east coast of, New of the United States, and so we'll send uh, the Mayflower, and we'll send these uh, Calvinists. I'm simplifying things, but that was the pilgrims who first came over, and they were coming for the religious liberty to be able to practice their form of Calvinism, um, that uh, their form of Protestantism, that uh, wasn't welcome in parts of Europe. Why wasn't it welcome? Well, they had three core beliefs, says Weber, that made them kind of odd. But also, if you understand these core beliefs, you'll understand why they helped create in America a form of capitalism that ended up changing the whole world. And what are these three beliefs? Well, the first one is kind of the strangest one, the strictest, most conservative one. And that's the concept of predestination. Most Christians today believe that you know anybody can earn their way into heaven by um, you know accepting Jesus Christ as their savior, as uh, the way many people put it. That's not what Calvin said. Calvin said you can't earn your way into heaven. There's only some people that get to go to heaven, and it's already been decided. Only the elect. Only the chosen go to heaven. And it's already been decided before you were born, before any of us was born, when God was creating the universe, according to Calvin, he already decided who the elect are and who get to go to heaven. And it's, most, it's not most of us. It's a small few. And the most people are going to be going to eternal damnation. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's just how it is. And that's a very 
hardcore, strict belief. Most Christians around the world don't believe that. That you're just stuck, whether with going to hell or not. Uh, and there's nothing you do about it. It doesn't matter how many old ladies you help across the street or how many dollars you give to the church or whatever. You, your fate is sealed. It's already predetermined, predestined. So that's kind of weird, but what's the second belief? The second belief is the idea of the calling. So when God was creating the universe and predestining everybody for what they're supposed to be doing, he has a calling. He's calling you, God, according to Calvin, to do his work on earth. In other words, the world is still being created by God, and as you're being born, you're being called to be part of God's creation and help God create the world. But you don't come with a little label on your toe when you're born telling you what you're supposed to be doing with your life. It's part of your job, your responsibility as an individual to figure out, what is God calling me to do? What am I supposed to be doing here on earth? And you're supposed to pay attention to signs that you might be getting from God. Like, Things like, if you notice, like, I'm always staring at people's feet, and I'm always, like, looking at their shoes and trying to figure out if they're at that, the best shoe for that foot, and I just notice sometimes people make really bad choices. Other people have beautiful shoes for their beautiful foot. I'm just, like, obsessed with the feet. Maybe God's telling me, shoemaker. Maybe you're into shoes. Maybe you should devote yourself to shoemaking. And once you find your calling, you have to have total devotion to your calling. You have to... Um, Say, this is what God wants me to do. That's the purpose of my life, is to devote myself to my calling. And you like it. In other words, once you find what God wants you to do, there's no sadness about having to go do it. You're excited to go fulfill God's plan for creation. The third destiny, the third uh, core belief, um, is the belief in asceticism. Asceticism. A-S-C-E-T-I-C-I-S-M, which means self-denial. So Calvin said, you know, creation's all about God. It's God's glory. It's to God's glory that creation is happening, and so if you as an individual are helping God with that creation, you shouldn't be going around calling attention to yourself and trying to take God's glory. Look at me. It's glory to God, but give it up to upstairs. That's where the glory goes, and so you shouldn't be calling attention to yourself here on earth. What did the uh, pilgrims wear? What are they famous for? They wore these little wooden shoes and black clothes. Their whole thing was, you don't wear colorful stuff. You're not trying to get all the attention. Nature is colorful, because uh, God, that's God's creation. And their churches were very um, modest. So again, one of the things they were doing was protesting against Catholicism. And Catholics were known for big, huge cathedrals, very expensive cathedrals with stained glass windows and carved altars and all kinds of effort being put into the fiscal structure of the church. But, uh, but Calvin insisted, you don't need a, a, a good physical structure. You just need a, a room, and then, you know, like a roof over your head. And so like the early churches of New England, the Calvinist churches were very plain, very simple structures with no stained glass and no sculptures and no stuff like that because they said all of that is glory to humans. Look at what I can do with stained glass. Look what I can do with sculpture. But we don't need all that. We're here to think about God and glory God. Well, so when you put those three things together, we're all destined for what we're destined for. But God gives us signs about what we're destined for. Signs that you might be among the elite. I didn't really mention that, but that's another piece of the puzzle here is you don't know exactly what your calling is. You don't know if you're in the elite. But if you get signs if that you might be, then that's a, a reason to devote yourself to a calling. If you're successful in your calling, that might be a sign that you're among the elite and the elect, and then you're going to go to heaven. So when you put all these three things together, you get very successful 
capitalists. Why are they so successful capitalists? Well, if you have these core beliefs, you first of all are going to get up earlier in the morning than people that don't have these beliefs because you're going to say, I can't wait to get up and serve God. I can't wait to go do my calling because it's to the glory of God and God doesn't want me sleeping. I'm awake, get out of bed, go do my work. And I don't, I don't hate my work. I don't sit there and go, I wish I could do anything but my work. I want to work all day long at my calling because it's all for God. It's glory of God. And what else would I be doing? Sin? And once I make money, here's the key too. If you are successful, so I open a shoe business. I'm great at making shoes. People come from all over New England to buy my shoes, have me make shoes for them. And I've got money rolling in. What should I do with my money, do you think, based on these core beliefs? of the Calvinists, what should you do with this profit you've earned in your calling? What does God want you to do with that profit based on these three beliefs? Asceticism being the one we haven't really talked about yet. But what should you do with your money? What do you think this morality leads to? Yeah. Um, like give it to people. Yeah. Give it to the poor? Why? I would say yes. <laughs> well, why give it to the poor? I mean, yeah, that would seem self-denial. I don't need it. God doesn't want me to keep it, but if I give it to the poor, would that be in keeping with these beliefs? Maybe not, because other poor people have to find their calling. And if I just give them money, then they're not going to want to work and go find their calling, so that wouldn't help God with his plan. So I'm not going to go give them money. They need to find their calling. Um... And I'm not going to go buy a bunch of bling with it, because I don't want to call attention to me. It's God's glory. What should I do? Save it, but what? What, what should I do with it? What's my total devotion to? What should I do with my money I've earned from my shoe business? Grow my shoe business! Oh. I've only got one shoe shop, and I got all this profit. Well, why don't I open three more shoe shops? Why don't I become the whole shoe king of New England and have shoe shops all over the place? In other words, you reinvest your profits. You don't just spend them on stained glass and statues and cars. You don't just give it away. You reinvest it in the calling so that the calling can be even more successful. And this idea of making money for God, in other words, it's getting rich for God in a sense, You're not doing it to call attention to yourself. You don't give it to the church. I mean, that would be another possibility, but that's not what Calvinism suggests because the church doesn't need money. We have a simple structure. Well, we, what we, you need to do is be even better at your calling. Devote it to the calling. You're devoted to your calling. Devote your profits to your calling. And Durkheim calls this purposive rationality. I mean, not their kind of favor. It's rational. I remember we talked about Weber saying his concern for the modern world is that rationality is out of control. That we're always trying to maximize our gain and minimize our loss, and this constant need to do that is actually making us more like machines and robots than like full human beings. But what is purposive rationality? Well, getting rich for God has a purpose to it. I'm getting rich each day, but it's to glory, to give glory to God. It's part of my religious duty. It's part of my religious fulfillment. And that means it has a certain check on it. For example, no work on Sundays. So the Calvinists, you know, as much as they were trying to get wealthy and uh, invest it back in their business, there were religious limits on that. So Sunday is the day you don't go to your calling. Sunday is the day you devote to God and prayer and all those things. It's interesting that our businesses still today, that I don't know if they call themselves Calvinists, some of them are Mormon, and I think Mormonism is in some ways related to Calvinism, and a lot of the people that came west from the east may have been more Calvinists, their relatives were, but anyway, so, um, but the businesses I'm thinking of are like R.C. Willie, Chick-fil-A, 
these businesses that are very successful businesses in America, but they still close on Sunday. They still say, there's a certain day we're not going to be making money. But most of the world has adopted what's called technical rationality. That's getting rich for wealth's sake. Getting rich to get rich. I mean, getting rich for God is one thing. That has a purpose. That's part of a larger belief system. It was fulfilling to the people doing it. They felt they're serving God and all that. But nowadays, most of us have to adopt this same kind of lifestyle. We have to be like Calvinists. In our current world, you're supposed to get up as early as possible. You're supposed to work as hard as possible. You're supposed to get as rich as possible. And if you're not doing those things, people are like, what's wrong with you? Why are you, what are you lazy? Are you a slacker? Are you unproductive? We're going to evaluate you and find out why you're so unproductive. And, uh, um, and that constant pressure to be productive, you know, it makes us feel like we're part of a rat race, like we're like on a wheel, like gotta get up, gotta work hard, gotta until you die. And what, what did we gain? Well, we got some money. But if that's all you're trying to do, get money to get money, then there's no check on it. Then it's like, well, why not have 7-Eleven open 24 hours, seven days a week, all the time, like always on capitalism. And that's the kind of world that we, many of us find ourselves living in, a world where you're supposed to be working constantly to get as rich as possible, and yet we don't, we're not communists. Um, I was in Spain, I did my junior year in Spain in 1989, and that was a time when Spain was shifting away from, it had been a socialist country, it was entering the capitalist global world. The whole world was becoming global capitalist, and Spain was feeling the pressure as a Catholic country to join the capitalist world. And Spain was a country that didn't always live according to these principles. For example, Spain had a tradition of siesta. Every day you come home to eat lunch from your job, and after you eat lunch, you take a nap for an hour or two. And then you go back to your work. And I love the lifestyle in Spain. It was so sweet to like wake up in the morning, go to your work for a little while, then come home, have a nice huge meal. That was the biggest meal of the day. And then just sleep for a while. And then you were refreshed and you could go back. And the idea in Spain, in every way, was we work in order to live. But we don't live to work. You go to your job so you make some money, but that's also that you can do the things that are life, like go have a drink of wine with some friends, go to a party, go to church. I mean, there's all kinds of other things to do in life besides work. And Spaniards like those things. But while I was there in 1989, the whole world was becoming capitalist and Spain was feeling pressure. And you could see it in the newspaper, on TV shows, people saying like, the English, they don't take naps. They don't take siesta. The Japanese, they don't take siesta. The Americanos, they don't take siesta. So while we're all napping, the rest of the world is making money and getting rich, and we're sitting around sleeping. So we got to stop this. we got to get rid of the siesta. And a lot of the companies in Spain were trying to say, no more siesta. We have to go to this rational way of living rather than this irrational, pleasurable way of living. In other words, Spanish culture was being seen as lazy and slow compared to the more Calvinist, Protestant, cultures of the of West, of, the, of England and America. And, and so the whole world really has had to adopt this lifestyle that America itself pioneered of spend your whole life trying to get as rich as possible, make money, make, make, making money the main thing of life rather than other sorts of beliefs and values people might have. Um, and so Weber says that's why we're getting to the point where a lot of us feel like we're in an iron cage, that term we used before where you're just stuck in a job and stuck in these rationalized things like McDonald's, you know, billions and billions served, very rational, very efficient, but uh, is it great food? Does it make you feel wonderful eating it? I don't know, I don't love McDonald's myself. Very rational, and in fact, there's a whole book in the, in the Weberian mode called The McDonaldization of Society, that our whole America has become like McDonald's in a lot of ways. Our schools become this way, our hospitals become this way, our food becomes this way. Um, and so, Weber's saying, you know, if you're a Calvinist, 
then devoting your life to your work makes sense. It feels good. And there's checks on it. You can take Sundays off and you can realize that the real reason I'm doing all this is for God and for creation, not for me and my money making. But if you're not a Calvinist, if you're a Spaniard or a Japanese person or an Indian or something, and you're suddenly having to live this life that Americans created, it can feel oppressive. It can feel like your own culture is being taken over and erased by this global capitalist machine of making money. And so people around the world do sometimes resist American cultural uh, influence. But the point is, is that uh, Weber is showing us that religion, this small little religion called Calvinism that really not very many people were part of, in pursuing its own beliefs, it ended up creating things that then affected the rest of the world. And the whole world has become a kind of, had to adopt a kind of Calvinist lifestyle, even though none of us remember that those beliefs anymore, like predestination and calling and all of that stuff. And we never had them to begin with. So, Marx and Durkheim. Marx and Durkheim are saying religion is the thing that holds groups together, keeps them doing things the same way they've always done, keeps the powerful in power, and keeps the other people obedient. So it's a conservative force. But Weber is saying no, it, it can be, and in many cases has been, the thing that gives people the, the strength of belief to, to change things. And say, well, I don't want things the way they are. I'm going to push it this way. And so, anyway, uh, what else can we say about that? So, actually, what time is it? I could start on my next topic, but I think we have about the right amount of time to turn things over to Denise, and she's going to. Uh, Do you still have a what time is this? It's eleven fifteen. Okay, so I only need about ten minutes. Okay, well, uh, I can see if you have questions. Do you need me to? Because we just finished up a major uh, piece of things, so we finished up with functionalism, um, and so just to kind of quickly make sure you understand what we have just done over the last few weeks. We started with the question, "What is functionalism?" and we recalled our earlier discussion of functionalism and said, well, compared to conflict theory, it's really all about social stability and social order. Whereas, function, whereas conflict theory was all about social change and revolution. And we said, uh, in order to have social ability and social order, functionalism is mainly focused on solidarity, social solidarity as the thing that makes those things possible. In other words, social glue, that unseen thing that keeps people working, feeling connected and working together in a connected way. And we asked, well, what is solidarity? It, it, it consists of a whole bunch of shared things, shared values, beliefs, rules, goals, symbols, there's a lot of ingredients that have to go into a successful sense that you're a group and you're willing to be part of the group and working together with it. And so anytime you've been, if you've ever had to form a team or a cast of a play or something like that, and you're trying to get people to work together, you know, it's good to try and make sure we're on the same page with our values, our beliefs, our rules, our goals, our symbols that we worship. And so, starting with that idea of solidarity, we went into two topics. We looked at deviance and conformity, which is really all about norms, about shared rules. And we talked about a lot of things under that heading, deviance and conformity. That's where we looked, for example, at crime theories. And we looked at crime measurement. And we looked at recent crime trends, and we were trying to understand, you know, um, how does functionalism help us understand these things? But also we looked at conflict theory and symbolic interactionism, too, as we considered functionalism's approach to crime and deviance, deviance and conformity. And now we just finished with the other topic, which was religion. And that, too, is another shit, you know, Shared beliefs, values, collective effervescence, 
Those are things that help with group solidarity. They're key ingredients. And so religion is one of the places functionalists have studied to understand that. But again, we compared it to conflict theory and, funk and symbolic interactionism and showed that there's other ways of looking at the same topic. There's other ways of looking at crime and deviance than the functionalist way, and there's other ways of looking at religion than the functionalist way. And so in considering functionalism, I tried to deepen our understanding of the other two perspectives. The third one is the, that third perspective, symbolic interactionism, is the one we've said the least about, and we're going to be, that's the next unit we're starting on. And so we're going to get into symbolic interactionism. And if you recall from earlier in the class, its main concern uh, is really with the social construction of reality. This idea that what human beings think is real or not isn't so much a matter of objective fact but it has to do with our own perceptions that we, through you know, the ways that we understand the world. And those understandings of the world come from human society. That's the point we'll be trying to make, and we're going to do it by looking at two things that don't seem like they're socially constructed. We're going to look at race and gender. Race and gender often seem like they're biological realities, that God, not humans, constructed those things. But sociologists insist that even these biological things about us are very much constructed realities, not just given to us by biology or by nature. And so if I can persuade you at all that things like our skin color and our, and our anatomy are also uh, constructed realities, then I think that will be a pretty powerful argument that we humans construct our reality more than are just dealing with an objective reality. So that's going to be my challenge to persuade you that race and gender are more in our heads and in our construction of reality than in our actual physical reality. And this, these, this one is really a, an important discussion to have in the current world, I think, because there's so much controversy over race and gender and all these questions like, can you change your gender? Should you be allowed to? Should people have to notify their parents? If uh, Should schools have to notify the parents if kids are saying that they're a different gender than they are? And um, all these uh, debates. I think sociology can clarify, I wish, like Durkheim, that if we could use sociology to guide some of these debates in our society, we would be able to get more on the same page about it. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk more about that just to give you a brief, a brief taste of what we'll be talking about. So we're going to start with gender. Well, I don't know if we will. <laughs> we'll have to decide. But just to give you a sense of starting with gender, sociologists, first of all, make a distinction between sex and gender. And this is uh, one of the things I think uh, is why we're having so much confusion in our society is our language makes sex and gender the same thing or you can use those words interchangeably and so people get all confused about what are we talking about when we're talking about sex and gender and i think sociology helps kind of clarify matters and not just sociology but social science but uh but here again i think psychology and sociology sometimes are distinct or have disagreements about this but sex versus gender. So we say they're two different things in sociology. And if we could keep them distinct from each other, it helps, I think, resolve some of these arguments people will be having. So sex, according to sociology, merely refers to whether you're male or female or not. And gender refers to something else, which is masculinity. and femininity. And immediately I want to call your attention to male-female is a binary thing. It's an either-or kind of thing. Now there are some people that say there are different other sexes, there might be more than just the two sexes, but they're pretty rare for people to be born with other sexual anatomy than male or female. So. But, but it's 
Either way, it's a categorical thing. You're either in this category or in that category. Whereas masculinity and femininity is more of a continuous, it's a continuum, as opposed to a set of categories. And so there's really an infinite uh, amount of masculinity and femininity. I mean, there's no finite distinctions between them, is what we're going to get at here. Well, how do you know your sex? What do I need to look at to determine what my sex is? Your body, your physical anatomy. In other words, it's a biological thing. It has to do with your anatomy. But how do I know if I'm masculine or feminine? Am I being the way you act? Am I being masculine right now? Yeah, am I being masculine right now? Am I being masculine right now? What are you saying, man? Huh? Um, how do I know? How would you say you said I was being masculine? I thought I was being feminine. How? How? Expression. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, to know my sex, I had to look here. Where should I look to know? Like, if you weren't here to tell me, and I want to know, but like looking in the mirror, am I being masculine or feminine right now? How would I know? Maybe the way you dress. Well, what do I consult? So yeah, I'm dressed this way. Is this masculine or feminine? <laughs> okay, what if I had long hair right now? Is that masculine or feminine? Mm. Both, maybe? Like, Depending on the way, the way the person acts. And the way oh, the so it isn't just the hair? Um, well, what I'm getting at is, how do I know, like, if I'm a Sikh male, and I have long hair, is that what a Sikh male is supposed to have? Yeah. Or if, what if I was an American Indian warrior, Native American warrior, and I had long hair and a headdress, is that feminine? On the other hand, uh, is it masculine? Is it masculine for an Indian warrior to have long hair? You could say it looks fierce. On the other hand, in today's Marines, if you try to wear long hair in the Marines, they won't let you be in the Marines. You have to have high and tight haircut to be a Marine. So which is it? Is short hair masculine or feminine? How do I know? What do I have to consult at? What do I have to look at? Not just my hair. Social roles. So I have to look outside. I have to look at the culture. In other words, we would say, these are culturally defined. Some cultures say long hair on a man is what's masculine. Some cultures say it's short hair. How I sit, um, you know, high heels. I might have already mentioned this in this class. High heels, we think of as a very feminine thing. And yeah, if you're immobilized, if you can't run away from a man because you're wearing high heels, maybe that is what we want our women wearing. Um, but originally, high heels were a warrior thing. It was a way to be able to ride a horse and shoot a gun at the same time. You don't need to hold the horse's reins. You can use the high heels to hold your feet in the stirrups and shoot a gun. And the guys that did that, they were so proud of their high class status. They owned horses. They owned nice leather boots. And they would walk around in their leather boots after their fighting, you know, and stuff. And it was a status symbol to be a man. And it made you taller than other people. So, like, it was a masculine thing. To have high heel boots. And then at a certain point in our history, it got redefined as this very feminine thing, and now most men don't want to be caught dead in high heels. So it's cultural, and like I say, it, it's not a, a clean cut thing. Sex is fixed. You can't change your sex, can you? Well, yeah. <laughs> nowadays you can with with, bio, with medical technology. But what you can't do, as far as I know, is change back. And maybe that's happened. I don't think, I think once you transition, you've transitioned. And you don't get to have both. You're one or the other. You're male or female. And yeah, nowadays you can be born male and go female or the other way, but it's still a fixed situation. You're one or the other. But gender is a variable thing. 
Gender isn't defined by us, it's defined by our culture. So what my culture thinks is feminine or masculine, that isn't really up to me, and I don't have much say in it. So I might like to sit like this, but my culture keeps telling me, well, you're not supposed to sit like that because you have a penis. I'm like, well, I like sitting this way. And so you might be male-bodied in the sense of having a penis and facial hair and stuff like that, but you might be drawn to very feminine things. I like to do theater. Does that make me gay? I don't think so. Just I'm a male that likes to do theater. Um, and so when it comes to masculine and femininity, there's a whole range of things you can be, and it's always changing. Like you could be masculine in the morning and feminine at night. You could really love watching a football game, drinking beer, and yelling at the screen as a female. And then after you do that, turn off the TV and yell. Let your baby to sleep. I mean, we're not one or the other, masculine or feminine. We're all of us are, have some masculinity that we like to engage in and some femininity, and it can shift all day long. And there's, so there's the first kind of variability was cultural variability. We said cultures vary in what they consider masculine or feminine. See, culture is different. It varies from American military marine culture. And uh, Native American warrior culture differs from you know, Sikh culture. Um, so cultures vary, and what they consider masculine or feminine has changed. You know, if you look around the world right now, you'll see different ideas. In India, for example, men often wear, walk hand in hand, I'm told, and people don't say, well, that's gay or that's something you're not supposed to be doing. Um, whereas here in our culture, we would assume things about people if they did that. And, uh, and so there's cultural variability, but there's also historical variability. The same culture can change over time. We could stay right here in America without leaving and see that gender varies over time in America. For example, blue jeans, originally totally masculine thing, designed by Levi Strauss, the company, for gold miners right here in our area. That's what they were for, gold miners. So if, if female people with female bodies now wear blue jeans, are they being gay? Are they being, mass, are they being transgender? No, they're, we now define jeans as a, can be a very feminine thing on, on people and can be very sexy on a female feminine person. And so we don't necessarily say it's uh, masculine. So something that was defined as a totally masculine thing way over here on this side of the continuum has moved to being somewhere kind of in between. You, be either masculine or feminine wearing blue jeans. And so our culture changed over time. And you know, just look at work. I mean, just look at college. College was defined as a totally male place, a totally masculine place where men did things like play football and beat each other in intellectual fights of intellectual dominance. And now there's fewer males in college, many fewer than females in our college, and colleges are being defined in a more feminine way in some ways, or more safe spaces for other kinds of uh, identities. And so things change over time when it comes to what we call gender. Sex doesn't change, though. Penises today are the same as they were 10,000 years ago. Vaginas are the same. Sex has not changed much, if at all, in human history. But our notions of what we call masculine or feminine has changed a lot and is changing even right now because of individual variability. So you yourself can change over time and or over in different contexts how, how masculine or feminine you want to be. I'm very feminine, I would say, with my small boys when I read them stories and sing lullabies to them and make them their favorite dessert, you know. But I like to be a little more masculine with my wife after they're asleep. So, you know, we, uh, we vary, right? And all of this suggests that gender is socially constructed. It, it, change, it, it depends. Like we said, it depends on what time period you're in, what culture you're in, how you're feeling, or what part of the day you're in, or what context you're in. Are you with your family? Are you at your job? Are you with your buddies? And so it's sex is not. I mean, sex and war is more given to us by nature. But gender is like the meaning of sex. What does it mean to have a penis or a vagina? What does it mean to wear short pants or a long dress or something? It's the meaning of these 
of this structural thing. So in some ways I could say this is the structure. Remember, structure is who has what. Just like in society, the structure of a social group is who has what in that group. And the culture is how do we think and feel about things. And so gender is more cultural. It's about how do we think and feel about these behaviors, these body parts. And so I think a lot of people are confused in America today. A lot of people are confused about their sex and go, well, I feel like I must need to change my sex or I'm not sure what sex I am. And I wish they would realize it's really gender that we are. Gender, if you realize all of us are variable gender. We all can be feminine and masculine. It really doesn't matter what your anatomy is. If people would accept that, I think they'd feel a lot freer being who, being who, having the, the, the structure that they have. Maybe you don't need to go get your structure changed by a doctor if it's okay to be as feminine as you want to be or as masculine as you want to be. Anyway, I'll leave it there. You guys can do that stuff. Okay, um, I'm Denise Burbach, by the way. I'm with the Early Childhood Education Department, and I've been tasked to do an evaluation of your professor. So um, we were not going to do an evaluation of your professor. And so this is one of those fill the bubble things. So I brought pencils for you. Um, you're going to fill in the bubble on the side. Um, please, if you have any comments that you wish to make anonymously, um, I'm sorry, just, I just write something on the back. Recording. Okay, because we professors really do appreciate that. We get.